All right, my name is Jaden Learman. The date is April 21st, 2022. The time is 9.23 a.m. I'm interviewing Dan Driscoll, who was born on uh, January, January 29th, 1963, and served from 1985 to 2012. Dan Driscoll was a captain in the U.S. Navy and served as an intelligence officer. Hello, Mr. Driscoll. Good morning. Uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? Uh, before I entered the Navy, I was uh, finishing up college at Northern Kentucky University. Okay. And then uh, what made you motivated to enter the Navy as opposed to going into a traditional career? Well, uh, more opportunities uh, were to be found by, I think, joining the military. That was the most uh, advantageous for me. And uh, it was a time when, uh, during the Reagan buildup, so it was uh, very easy to uh, uh, go into the Navy. So that's what I decided to do. Um, was there any, like, uh, did the Navy market to you at all, as opposed to, like, you know, the other branches of the military, or is it just you kind of wanted to see the world by the oceans? Uh, it was it was by accident, actually. I was going to go into the Marines because my brother had been a Marine. And uh, when I went to the recruiting office, the Marine uh, recruiter was out to lunch. So the uh, Navy officer uh, grabbed me, and here I am. It was... Uh, it was simple as that. I didn't know anything about the Navy, to be honest. What was your uh, path into the Navy, and uh, what made you choose being an officer over being a traditional enlisted? Uh, uh, I had a college degree, and uh, being an officer was uh, unusual uh, for where I grew up, you know, blue-collar neighborhood and such. Uh, so I was sent uh, to Pensacola, Florida, Aviation Officer Candidate School uh, for the Navy, where they train the pilots and uh, navigators for uh, naval aviation, but also the Navy, uh, Naval Aviation Intelligence. Uh, so we were to be acclimated to the world of aviation in the Navy, and uh, I went there for three months, and after that, I was sent to uh, Air Force Intelligence Training Command in Denver, Colorado, uh, to learn how to be a uh, 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 naval intelligence, imagery analysis, uh, how to uh, just, uh, communications, uh, how to do briefings, stuff like that. Okay. What was uh, Officer Candidate School like in uh, Pensacola, Florida? Uh, a lot of push-ups. You know, they teach you what it's like to be in the Navy, how to wear the uniform, uh, a lot of the traditions of the Navy. Uh, so uh, I just remember we had uh, Marine drill instructors. Uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Gunny Gerhardt uh, was uh, was uh, our instructor, and uh, yeah, you do a lot of running, a lot of push-ups, a lot of classroom work. So was it was Officer Canada School different than what you expected, or was it pretty much just the the hard work of the military that you kind of expected going into? Um... Uh, it wasn't. I wouldn't say it was hard as much as uh, by purpose. You know, you're tired. You know, you're always busy, and then uh, you have to, uh, they try to teach you how to excel under stressful situations, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, you had to learn about uh, air navigation, something I've never done before in my life, how to use a pinwheel to uh, track your altitude and wind speed and, and all that good stuff, as if you were a pilot going from an aircraft carrier back to a ship, so... Uh, but it was uh, exciting. I don't think it was hard as much as it was exciting. I enjoyed it. Okay. Um, so then what was the transition from school to actual service like? Was it a rough transition or was it very uh, smooth in what you expected? Uh, I found it very easy. I, uh, I, I would call it smooth. It was, uh, uh, you know, I was finally on my own, uh, you know, getting a little bit of a paycheck in uh, you know, I went from, uh, you know, a uh, small town in Kentucky to uh, Japan. And then, uh, you know, right away I was seeing the world, which is what I had wanted to do. Okay. Uh, what was uh, the expectations versus reality on your first deployment? Were they vastly different or was it pretty much what you expected given the experience in candidate school? Uh, it was, uh, I, I didn't have any expectations. I didn't know anything. So, uh, uh, 
But I just remember uh, finally getting out to the fleet is where you want to be. You know, it's the tip of the spear. And uh, I just, you know, the camaraderie of everybody in your uh, squadron or unit is, is a lot of fun and everything's new and different. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, how to uh, follow a war room etiquette on a ship to, uh, uh, you know, working uh, typically, you work seven days a week, 14, 16 hours a day is the norm. And uh, now when you're at sea and that's just what you do. No, I, I, I was young. I didn't care. It was a lot of fun. Okay. And then uh, what were your basic duties when you uh, first arrived out in the fleet as your intelligence officer? Uh, my primary duty was working in the carrier intel center where we would debrief the pilots. Uh, we would do target planning. Uh, we would uh, uh, catalog and, and uh, uh, report uh, uh, shipping in the area. Uh, we would do a lot of training for the pilots, how to identify uh, enemy uh, ships or enemy aircraft. And then uh, we did a lot of uh, analysis of the uh, geopolitics of the area uh, as the carrier moved around. So uh, uh, it was just basic, you know, basic entry into intelligence. You know, you're learning uh, new terms. Uh, you're, you're learning new, how to deal with new problem sets. And, uh, and that was the purpose. You, the first two years in the Navy is to learn about the Navy. That's how they trained us. Okay. So on those, uh, first deployments you had, who did you generally work with? Uh, and, uh, how did you gather your information, uh, in intelligence? Well, we worked with the pilots and the entire air wing, uh, we would uh, debrief them when they would come back from uh, their um, aircraft missions. So uh, typically when the carrier was uh, uh, transiting, you know, you're in the open ocean, the carrier would be as far away from shipping lanes and land mass as possible just for safety reasons. So there was not a lot of uh, actual activity, but uh, you're preparing to go to uh, uh, conduct your operations in like, say, the North Arabian Sea off the coast of Iran. So uh, we do a lot of training. Uh, they would simulate uh, strikes from the aircraft carrier. And then uh, the intel officers would uh, be studying uh, 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 coastal defenses of Iran, uh, small boat tactics of Iran, uh, and, and wants to uh, deliver targets or deliver weapons on targets, as well as defend the uh, carrier and the other battle group assets. Okay, so what was it like transitioning from sort of a peacetime state to uh, the wartime state of the uh, first Gulf War uh, in which you served? Uh, well, it was the, probably what uh, caught me a little bit off guard was the speed and pace of uh, when you're actually in, in, in uh, a real conflict because uh, you have a uh, heavy demand for information. It has to be accurate, it has to be complete, and it has to be ready when the uh, commanding officer asks for it. So, uh, and that's the nature of intelligence is you always have to anticipate and be prepared for any situation and that can change at a moment's notice. And uh, uh, what was exciting for me uh, the first time I was in a conflict was in the uh, headquarters in Saudi Arabia with General Schwarzkopf's staff, was the, uh, uh, just the expertise and knowledge of people that had been working uh, the Iraq or Iran problem for years and in the depth of knowledge they knew. I mean, you, I came across uh, 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 military liaisons, people that had studied Arabic and were fluent in Arabic and had lived in uh, Lebanon uh, Baghdad, they they uh, were you know spent their entire lives you know preparing for such a scenario. So I guess what shocked you the most about that conflict, just the the pace change, or uh, I don't think it, what shocked me was uh, just the uh, uh, the devastation that you'll see in in a conflict. Uh, I had the uh, I guess the privilege of going into Kuwait City right after the uh, the Iraqis had evacuated 
were retreated. And uh, I mean, Kuwait City was pretty much bombed out. There was not much there. Uh, the beaches, we walked along the beaches were all mined, barbed wire, ready for uh, an amphibious assault, which never happened. And then uh, we uh, went up to the uh, Highway of Death, which was the main highway leading out of Kuwait back to Iraq. And it was just littered with Iraqi armored vehicles and tanks that had been more or less obliterated by uh, uh, U.S. aircraft. Uh, and, and, you know, you're talking for several miles, just nothing but destroyed vehicles and, and bomb craters. It was, it was pretty eye-opening, something you would never expect to see in life. So did you have, you spoke of uh, people with great amounts of expertise on the Iran-Iraq conflicts. Uh, did you have a mentor when you were working uh, in intelligence? Uh, I would say uh, my mentors were, uh, when I was working in Washington, D.C., and that was the norm, you know, you're, you're in an intelligence command, uh, so typically your mentor would be a, a fellow Navy intelligence officer, more senior, would take you under his wing and, and uh, give you advice on career opportunities, uh, that they'd share their own experiences, and they'd also have to teach you how to be an officer you know, how to deal with discipline issues, how to uh, plan and manage uh, a large organization. Uh, uh, so I, I recall my mentors, uh, think of them very fondly. Uh, they were wonderful officers, uh, Captain Nels Litzinger and uh, Captain uh, Rich Rizika, uh, uh, Admiral Tony Cawthron, uh, people I still in contact today. Uh, that is very interesting. Uh, so what was it like working on a general staff as uh, compared to just a carrier air wing? Uh, it, was, it was much harder on, on the Admiral staff. The uh, uh, air wing, it was much more uh, almost like a frat house. It was a lot of joking, a, a lot of goofing off. Uh, it was like an old boys club. And then uh, on the flag staff, it's much more the senior officers are, are uh, uh, you know, captains and, and commanders are the norm, where in an air wing, uh, it's lieutenants and, and ensigns. And, uh, and then, of course, you have the admiral who is always around and uh, he, he uh, very experienced individuals, uh, very demanding, high powered individuals. And there was a lot of pressure. And you want to succeed, so you put a lot of pressure on yourself. It was a good experience. I liked it. Okay. So how was uh, working the embargo of Haiti uh, later on in your career different than working in your traditional uh, combat situation, such as the uh, uh, Gulf War? Well, uh, Haiti was unique because it was not in, never intended to be combat. It was intended to be peacekeeping. So... Uh, uh, all the military resources were uh, directed to maintain and enforce an embargo, but not to uh, create any casualties, not to uh, you know, worsen an already bad situation. So, uh, uh, you know, we had to enforce the embargo, something that is uh, not easy, considering the amount of water space that we had to control. Uh, you know, the geographic area was just very difficult. You had ships coming from every direction. And you only had so many ships and, uh, you know, to enforce and patrol all the areas. And uh, uh, we had a perfect record. Uh, we could uh, show that we had uh, no ships were able to break the embargo until one night when we, uh, a French destroyer that was part of our task force uh, radioed in that they, they had a... Uh, merchant ship trying to run the blockade and they wanted permission to fire on it. And uh, I was there when the Admiral said no. And, and, and he was willing to break a perfect record. And he explained that he was a wonderful, it was Admiral Gaiman uh, uh, who had explained, he goes, uh, as much as it would be good for all of us to have a perfect record uh, on this mission, uh, he had to weigh the considerations, the political fallout if we fired on a uh, basically a, a merchant ship, a non-combatant, and uh, 
and he didn't want that embarrassment for the United States. So I, I just found that fascinating. Uh, and uh, it was a int- good life experience. Yeah, you said you worked with uh, several nations, uh, navies during that embargo. What was it like uh, working with the different nations as opposed to just working internally with uh, just U- the U.S. Navy? Well, uh, at that point, it was almost all U.S. Navy. And then uh, when you deal with intelligence, we have very little interaction with foreign governments because uh, we don't share our information with them. Information sharing is only done at their highest level. So uh, uh, even at a battle group level, uh, any exchange of information with our allies was usually done out of Washington or the uh, headquarters uh, in t- uh, that time. Uh, uh, well, it was mostly out of, I would say, Norfolk at that time where the information would be exchanged. But uh, that was always a difficulty uh, back in the early 80s and 90s. Uh, everyone knew what information we had. We just couldn't share it. Okay. So you said that the uh, French destroyer was operating underneath you guys. Was it operating as part of just a, like uh, independent um, uh, ship or was it operating as sort of just kind of uh, part of your uh, U.S. Navy squadron? It was part of the uh, international uh, enforcement task force set up, primarily U.S. ships commanded by our U.S. Admiral. But the uh, Navy ship and British ships would be uh, uh, under the command of the uh, uh, Navy Admiral, U.S. Navy Admiral. And, and that's a common practice to where uh, we always have agreements with other countries and they're willing to place their uh, ships, their forces under the command of a uh, a U.S. flag officer. Okay. Uh, So what do you feel like was your most important role uh, in that situation? Uh, Just giving accurate and clear information to the uh, admiral who's got to make decisions such as whether to board a ship, whether to direct another ship to a new position. Uh, uh, So uh, we were providing information that may or may not be familiar uh, to the Admiral. Uh, We were off Haiti and uh, we were a battle group that had trained uh, and were prepared to go deploy to the Mediterranean in the Middle East. And then overnight, we're told to go to the Caribbean and work a whole new problem set. So uh, uh, we had people that didn't know where Haiti was on a map. And uh, so you're uh, spending a lot of time learning yourself and then being able to explain that accurately and concisely to uh, decision makers. Okay. Uh, That must have been a very large departure from what you uh, were expecting. Um, So what was it like when you had to switch from more of a a seagoing position to more of an onshore position when you moved to a a, a position of operation in Afghanistan? Uh, That's a big transition. I I had uh, fortunately experience with uh, ground operations as a, a junior officer when I was in Korea. Again, when I was at Desert Storm, uh, was primarily, it was all ground operations. Then, of course, I had been in Iraq. So I felt pretty well prepared when I went to Afghanistan. Uh, And even then, once I got there, I was surprised at the uh, uh, nuances, the differences, the characteristics unique to Afghanistan. Uh, But uh, as a whole, I... At that point in my career, I was considered a joint officer. So uh, I wasn't uniquely Navy. I was expected uh, to work both in support of ground operations, air operations, space operations. I should be able to do it all. And uh, we had that designation as a joint officer uh, uh, called a kind of purple officer is what the nickname was. But it was a joint officer designation. So we were trained to be able to work with all the services. Uh, how long did it take you to get trained as a uh, joint officer, uh, particularly in the Navy? Uh, there was a pro- 
program that uh, you're expected to follow. You weren't allowed to do it until you're at least a lieutenant commander in 04. And then only after you had uh, training uh, at a national war college. And, uh, but I was able to be the youngest and uh, youngest officer ever to get the joint service designation because I had completed uh, uh, the war college as a brand new Oak, uh, Lieutenant Commander. And, uh, and I was given credit of my time in Desert Storm. So uh, I was given the uh, joint service officer designation as a uh, uh, more or less as a uh, brand new Lieutenant Commander when most people were getting it as commanders and the captains. Uh, so was your role as a joint officer more stressful uh, than the role as just a Navy officer uh, earlier in your career? Uh, I would say yes, because there weren't, you know, the United States Navy is the biggest and most capable Navy in the world by far. I mean, we don't have a peer competitor. Uh, but when you get into other forms of military operations, it, it's more complex and uh, you don't you don't receive training on everything. So uh, working with uh, your counterparts that have been trained in ground warfare or trained in space warfare or cyber warfare, you can be at a disadvantage because all your training is on how to uh, conduct uh, naval battles that haven't been done since World War II. That's uh, very interesting. Must have been a big transition. Uh, but what was uh, daily life like in the Navy? I mean, we've spoken about your roles, but what was the normal life like just uh, on an ocean-going vessel? Uh, well, uh, it's 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 pretty pretty. I call it pretty exciting, and uh, I enjoyed it as a very comfortable routine. You get the whistles and bells go off. You know, uh, reminding people to go to their quarters or, you know, to start the work day. You just you just get to learn to know all the habits and traditions that are unique to the Navy. Uh, you go to the uh, officer's wardroom. Uh, there's a protocol. Uh, you know, there's uh, you ask for permission to join at a table if you're the junior officer. Uh, you know, there's expectations depending on your rank. Uh, and of course, you know, you get into a, just the, the daily routine. You prepare for the morning brief with the Admiral. Uh, you get the daily tasking, then you turn around and, uh, coordinate with other offices on the ship. And then uh, next thing you know, it's midnight time to go to the rack and start all over again. Okay. So, um, it sounds like life was very regimented. What, what was different, uh, when, uh, moments were more intense on the ship, like, what were your most intense moments uh, during your service in the Navy? Uh, I think uh, the tense moments would have been uh, anywhere from, when I was a young officer, we would have the uh, Russian bombers would take off out of uh, now Russia in the Far East. And they would, they would come, they would fly down around Japan to uh, Cameron Bay off Vietnam. So we always practice being able to intercept the aircraft uh, at uh, well outside of their own missile range to protect the carrier. And it was a test, it was training, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, pride and ego being able to uh, recognize the early warning, the indications that they were launching uh, and then uh, relaying that information, predicting where they would be in relation to the carrier so they could properly put the uh, intercept aircraft out. And uh, that, that was, uh, call it stressful, could also be kind of fun. Uh, I think uh, the only other stressful time, I would say, uh, when I was responsible for uh, uh, soldiers, uh, doing operations in Afghanistan and we would have bombings. Uh, uh, in Kabul, we had a major bombing that shut down the city. And I had to, uh, you know, you want to locate and account for all your people where they are. And then when they're out of communication for whatever reason, uh, you know, you're racing, uh, you know, to identify them, get them to a safe harbor, all that stuff. So that can be pretty stressful. 
Okay. Uh, so what was the uh, most memorable moment of your service in the Navy? Oh, I had a lot of them, but I think uh, probably the most memorable would be, uh, I'll be honest, most memorable was uh, on the carrier midway, uh, getting up, walking on the flight deck on the day we had pulled into Hong Kong. And it was just like a poster, uh, a recruiting poster. You know, and a little Sam Pams and all the ships and Hong Kong along the coast. It was just, uh, you know, the sun was coming up and there you are on the U.S. aircraft carrier. That was, that was pretty special. That was fun. Okay. Um, so what was your, uh, speaking of ports of call, what was your uh, favorite port of call that you uh, visited? I had a lot of them, but probably my favorite would be, because uh, I've been there so many times, uh, Subic Bay in the Philippines. Uh, we midway would pull in there on a regular basis and, uh, uh, you know, we would go to the officer's club on, uh, QB on QB point, which was, uh, you know, surrounded by jungle and overlooked the Harbor. And then, uh, we'd go out in town where every squadron had their own bar and, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I would, I, I think QB was, uh, the old Navy. You know, you, you uh, that that doesn't exist anymore. It's gone away, and I'm glad that I was able to see a little bit of it. So, okay. Uh, so, out of all the ships you served on, which one was uh, the most enjoyable, or at least your favorite one? Uh, that's a tough one because my first ship, the Midway, I wasn't ship's company. I was on a squadron. Uh, and I still stay in touch with a lot of guys from my first squadron. Uh, but uh, my one and only ship I was assigned to was the Enterprise. And that was also where I had uh, uh, my, my position as a senior intel officer is kind of a capstone uh, career uh, uh, event being the ship's intel officer. And I enjoyed that probably uh, as, as much as the Midway. So I would say Enterprise. Okay. Um, and then uh, what do you think was your most important contribution to the Navy uh, during your time in the service? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think, I think uh, my most important contribution to the Navy uh, was probably my uh, last command. So uh, I was in charge of a... Uh, 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 I was assigned uh, as a Navy captain to my uh, command in Germany, and the, and the work was highly coveted by the Army. Uh, they preferred that job, and they really uh, would, uh, uh, and, and uh, to, be go, to go in there as a, uh, and to represent the Navy as a Navy captain and to succeed in the, in the, in the job, which was very complex, meet the uh, high demand uh, for uh, what was needed by the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, you know, I kind of like, we'll like to say that uh, we made the Navy look good, so. Uh, what, what did your last command in uh, Europe involve? Uh, mostly uh, I, what I was responsible for was running uh, uh, information collection operations throughout Europe for, uh, European Command and the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and then I inherited also the responsibility of the same mission for all of Africa. And then uh, uh, that was during the Iraq-Afghan War. So then I had a third mission of providing uh, human collectors information, strategic debriefers uh, to deploy to Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, elsewhere in support of that conflict. So, uh, uh, it was a lot of uh, uh, movement of people that were highly trained and skilled, uh, working with embassies and, and uh, liaison with our host country partners. So uh, that's uh, that was probably the, the extent of it. It was a good job. Okay. And uh, during your intelligence commands, you uh, were you focused primarily on the people who were actively involved in the theater of uh, conflict or your specific command or more of the people who were, or the people, countries, um, 
governments who were on the outskirts of your uh, your objective or your command, who weren't like directly involved in it, but uh, could be involved in it? Yeah, it would be mostly the latter because uh, working at uh, where I was at for the Secretary of Defense, we collected strategic intelligence. So it would be what was Russia doing to disrupt US efforts in Afghanistan? What was China doing in Africa? You know, what were the uh, motives of the Israelis stealing technology from the United States? Uh, so that's all the stuff that we focused on at strategic level. So uh, I had actually, it was a global mission. We were just based out of Europe, but we were responsible for a global picture. And, uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, but we also did have to be responsible for uh, potential theater events, what was going to happen in Afghanistan uh, or Iraq, and quickly relay that information to the right decision maker. Okay. So uh, what surprised you the most about conducting those intelligence operations? Like, what did you not expect uh, to be part of your duties? What I wouldn't know, I guess it was, uh, I wouldn't call it a surprise. I was always amazed that how senior officers uh, with years of experience did not understand the basics of intelligence. Uh, they would expect information to be readily available whenever they needed it. Uh, not understanding that uh, good intelligence takes years to develop. You have to uh, uh, put people in the right place with language training and, and skills to collect information over years uh, because it's intelligence is not CNN. Uh, it's, 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 you just don't get it with a snap of your fingers. It, it takes time. And uh, so, but a lot of senior officers thought uh, satellite imagery is just like the movies. You know, you can collect a video from a satellite immediately by moving it over New York City and watch Tom Cruise, you know, run around the street. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, uh, you have multi-billion dollar assets that to move them uh, uh, for one photo may take a year off its uh, uh, service life. So uh, they're very demanding decisions and you got to be very careful. And uh, but everybody thinks it's like CNN and it's not. It's very uh so if you were to explain it to someone who was not familiar with the intelligence, what is the, uh, what is like a common misconception people have besides the fact that intelligence is not easy to collect? Is it the fact that maybe uh, intelligence collecting is not just like your typical James Bond type spies or is it what, like what's largest misconception? Yeah, we're not James Bond. That No one does that. Uh, it's a lot of time sitting behind a cubicle just reading reports and, and uh, uh, really uh, spending days and days coming up with nothing. And then uh, it's, it's, it can be very tedious and boring, to be honest. Okay. Uh, so you said that uh, this European command was your last command. What motivated you to leave uh, the service? Uh, I had 27 years and uh, it was... Uh, 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 a good time, really, uh, not so much for me, but for my family. Uh, my oldest child was getting ready to start high school. Uh, my uh, second child had been in six schools in eight years. So it was time to, uh, you know, uh, give them something for themselves. So, uh, so when I finished up in Europe, that was a good time to retire. Okay. Uh, so what was it like for your family? Uh, or what was family life like while you were uh, in the service? I had to ask my wife that. She, uh, she did all the work. You know, I was, uh, uh, we moved to, uh, we got married, uh, had uh, our uh, first, our two children that were still in diapers when uh, I went off to uh, Bahrain for a year on a company. So, you know, she had, all, she had to pay the bills, and take care of two little kids. And so she had all the hard work. And then we moved to, uh, uh, finally got to California, lived on the beach. And I went to Iraq for a year, you know? So 
So you got stuck with all that, you know, getting the kids in the school and getting them to the school. And uh, so they, they, it's the wives back home do all the work. And I think most uh, people in the military will tell you that. Okay. So what was it like transitioning back to civilian life from the military? Uh, it's, it's certainly different because, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the Navy, I had, uh, rank and privilege and, uh, uh, and I certainly had a status so I could wear my uniform, walk around a base and, and, uh, it was, uh, certainly a, a comfortable existence. You know, I was in command, and, but, uh, you know, you leave the military, you, you take all that off. And no one knows who you are. No one cares. And you got to adjust to that. And uh, it's kind of nice to be uh, uh, anonymous and, and uh, invisible. But then again, I also kind of miss the uh, uh, some of the comforts that uh, uh, high positions in the military bring people. So I won't lie. Okay. It's nice to have a parking spot in front of the exchange. Yeah. I bet it is. What's one lesson that you learned in the Navy that you still use today? Or I guess the biggest lesson that you learned that you still use? Uh, I would tell, what I tell most people, it's, it's the, uh, it's probably going to be the best time of your life serving in the military. Uh, uh, a lot of people never have that experience. And uh, most people, most veterans I've come across will honestly say, that was the best time of my life. I wish I stayed in uh, because they're uh, they're all young, invincible. Uh, they're doing fun things. They're doing things that most people will never experience. And uh, it is it is a uh, uh, wonderful time. And I was glad I was able to do it for 27 years. So, okay. In closing, uh, this has been an interview of Dan Driscoll regarding his service from 1985 to 2012. My name is Jaden Learman. The time is at 10 o'clock or 10 a.m. Uh, th or thank you for interviewing Mr. Driscoll. And most importantly, thank you for your service. Jaden, thank you. And you did a wonderful job. I appreciate it. Right, thank you. Yeah. Oh,